Sonically, yes. not of this earth. He was going to portray pure sexuality. I love that it was outrageous. He broke a lot of rules. Right. And you can conquer anything, just as I do. If the sky has blood in it, blue and red make purple. If the music is knit into your bones so bad that you need to make music almost every single working hour of the day, that in working hour, that you need to make it every leisure hour of the day. It's the thing that you live for. To you, it's more valuable than eating, breathing, and sleeping. And the persistence is automatic. The work ethic is there. You have part of what it takes to be a star. The other part of what it takes is that ability to go explosive and ecstatic on stage and take the audience explosive and ecstatic with you. Those were all qualities that Prince had, possibly more than any other musical artist. It was a perfect storm. I loved to listen to him play the piano. We would stop mixing and uh, he would come out and start playing the piano. Or He sat here and was playing that song, in Purple Rain, and then stopped and said, I'm going to make a movie. And, was like, and then he left. They cut it live. And that was huge. We had run out of money. Warners was supposed to give us seven million. Geffen, he had made that movie about the hookers and the college kid. Risky business. Yeah, Tom Cruise. He wanted me to wait another year, get Prince to be bigger, and make the movie for a million less than I thought we could make it. Finally tonight, comedian Richard Pryor is feeling better. Doctors at his Sherman Oaks, California hospital have taken him off the critical list. Pryor is responding well to skin graft treatments for burns he suffered at his home three weeks ago. What we're looking for are good scripts that we can produce under my banner and put out in the marketplace. Try, what we want to do is, is do quality films with the money that we have to do it with. That was a birth of Indigo. We had $40 million that we could do anything we wanted to do. Richard Pryor had a company called Indigo. The movie uh, Purple Rain was really the first venture that I wanted. And I said, Richard, this is it, man. I said, Prince is just about to break out. But Richard didn't know who Prince was. Jim Brown wanted more control than he knew was possible to give him. When you manage Prince, you know that you got to protect yourself from impossible situations. He's not going to listen to Jim Brown, no matter how big he is. We were preparing to get the film out, so before Purple Rain. It would be like, okay, show up at 11 in the morning for rehearsal, jam for a couple hours, work on the show, and then by the time 6 or 7 o'clock or so rolls around, we're done. We can go. Well, or you, 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 or you run it again after dinner. Or you run it again. Or you video <laughs> it and watch the yeah. video of it, and then you go, but go ahead. And, and, but, <laughs> then we would go in the studio after all that, late at night, and be there till. The sun was almost coming up. We were in rehearsals. I heard through the grapevine that you had a new tune written by a couple great girls. Well, it comes off that way in the movie, but they didn't really write it. I was really young. I was 19. But they, they knew better than to make plans. You just didn't dare make plans. It was, it was all about him indulging us. That's what retainers are for. You're on call, baby. 24-7. In fact, let's play First Avenue tonight at midnight. That's called improvising, yeah. which you could do. Yeah. But you would get a look. I mean, you would get a thumbs up or a thumbs down instantaneous. If you tried something, you'd know right away if it was approved or not. There wasn't any, oh, I listened to it last night, it sounds good. It's like he heard everything meticulously, like you said, in his head. So if you improvise something, do it again. You know, I like that. I and mean, then you do it, and then you could do that for another half an hour. Prince came to a rehearsal one day and said, here's the song I'm working on. He said, I have this song idea, and it goes a little something like this, and it was right. like this little country tune. He played the like triads on the piano, uh, but he had the melody and he had uh, words. He had the chord progression, he had a little bit, some of the lyrics done. And he said, what are you all going to come with? What can you do? What, right. what, what, what's your thing on this? Basically, he, he just let all of us write our own parts to the song. When it came to the songs, we were all 100% invested. Oh, my writing style, everything that I was about was invested in him. And we would help Prince come up with these creative ideas, these songs and things. So Wendy was definitely correct in saying that. And I thought to myself, how do I make those chords bloom mm -hmm. with this very simple melody? And I stretched the chords and we started working out all of our parts to Purple Rain. And, yeah. and I just came up with this iconic intro came out yeah. of me. Yeah. And Prince kept having me play it longer and longer and longer. 
There's video footage of it where he has me playing it for like 10 minutes before he comes back and starts the song. We knew it was something. Even if we did it, he came up with it. And it was actually recorded to a recording truck. They had a, a, a regular truck outside for recording. Here we played Purple Rain here before it was even on a record. You know, people here are very loving. Uh, they are open to change. They have always been able to break new music here. Said I like to do a new song. The whole place went to a hush. The whole place. There was actually a third verse in that song that got cut out. Yeah, there's like a live version of it that's performed at First Avenue where the song was debuted, captured the whole show, and some of those songs were used on the movie soundtrack, including that version of Purple Rain with an edit, which cut that verse out. Actually recorded that evening the, that night at First Avenue was um, a foreshadowing for sure because there were at least three tracks that ended up being the you know the recorded versions for the album. It was my first show with the band. When Purple Rain was filmed, all the tourists came in. As Prince there, I could have Sonny Ade or Neville Brothers on stage, and people, who the f cares? You know, I mean, they want to see Prince. Is he around? I was in the truck recording with the new band. Basically with Wendy, Wendy and Lisa and uh, Mark Brown on bass. My brother was still playing drums and Dr. Fink. I mean, when I was recording the, the live concert of Purple Rain, it was nerve wracking, but the band is so good that all I'm doing is just capturing it. Uh, when I arrived a little bit later, like a week afterward, I worked on those tapes and I did a lot of the overdubs that became the Purple Rain record. I mean, it was a live recording, everything. All his vocal, his guitar, everything. It was a live recording. At the time, I didn't realize how big of a smash that was going to be. And that was a real rewarding experience to, to record that. The only thing that was fixed was the bass because that bass that Mark used was wireless. And the, at the time, wireless wasn't up to par and the frequency wasn't really represented and it didn't fall full frequency. So we replaced that and then added a string section with the orchestra. You know, I will make an album. You know, sometimes I change lyrics. And again, you wait until, you know, you find other things to go with it. That's why it takes a long time to come out with albums. The rest of that track is as is. They cut it live and he brought it back and that's when we started working on Purple Rain. He brought some stuff from Minneapolis. So in New York, we used Electric Lady Studio. Sunset Sound, we used in LA. In Minneapolis, we used Prince's Warehouse. You know, I mean, he was so good that he, he'd play something and it would be it. There wouldn't be any redos or fixing or punching in or anything. It wasn't like he came in and said, good morning, how are you? How was your weekend? We were doing Purple Rain and there were a bunch of people I remember wondering, Lisa were here. He came out and he said, I need strings. It's midnight. And I went, okay, thinking, you know, okay, so I'll call, you know, an arranger tomorrow morning. And I said, when? And he said, now. And I went, 
I said, it's midnight. He said, get it. You remember Chunky, Novi, and Ernie? They had just done something in Studio One, and I called up Novi, and I said, would you be interested in playing on a Prince record? And she said, yeah. And I, it was literally 12 o'clock. And I said, do you have a cello player? And she said, yep. Okay, can you come down? And she came down at one o'clock in the morning. He was playing. He would come out here and play the piano for hours. And everything was always set up for him to go. You know, the mics and everything stayed. Now the board had to change because it wasn't big enough to do both. We would stop mixing and uh, he would come out and start playing the piano or pick up the guitar. Or usually it was the piano. He spent hours playing. It was, I loved to listen to him play the piano. Mm. And then you could hear something coming together and it was like, oh shit. <laughs> and he, then he would say, <laughs> put up some fresh tape. So I would throw the board over to live too. I had a, a Sunset Sound track sheet that I roughly put my EQ and oh. I would madly like, and he would say, you're blowing the groove, hurry up, hurry up. And they played till 3.30. We were cutting Ice Cream Castle. Ice Cream Castle worked on the kid in LA with Morris on drums, especially Prince and Morris together. It was purely magic. I was in there and was just fortunate enough to come up with Jungle of the music, the Jungle of music. And Prince was like, yeah, that's what I'm talking about right there. That's, that's, this is what I'm talking about. So then we... That song came together, a bass line submitted from Jesse Johnson really came, came up with the bass line. And Prince just took that ball and ran with it. Yeah, and, and, you know, Jungle Love sounded like a hit to me. But Jungle Love, if you ever hear his version, I mean, he, it was the same song, but if you ever hear his vocal, he put his foot in it. <laughs> and Morris did a great job of Prince. If you heard Prince wrote that melody and the lyrics and all But it's just a whole twist. He you know, dude could sing when he wanted to. and Because that was the three amigos right there, Morris, Prince, and I. It's like you, it was, it, you... You saw one, you saw the three of us. There was a period where you never saw, and there was other reasons, personal reasons, why it was just ended up being just Prince and I all the time.
I know the first time I sang, attempted to sing Sex Shooter to his vocal was at his house. Mm. He wrote it for, for Denise. He says, sing something. So I sang uh, When I Get Older. And I'm 64. <laughs> he just looked at me like, I had a great time doing it. Uh, I didn't sing the entire song because I got nervous. And he was like, okay. And he said, he goes, your voice is sweet. You know, I was like, all right. And that was the first time. He was the producer, he was the artist, and he was the engineer. He needed me, but he also knew a lot himself, you know. Purple Rain is kind of a spontaneous thing, even though it was completely pre-written by him as a song. He let it go and let the band kind of develop their parts and let it play. You know, there's one thing about the individual and there's another thing about the persona of the individual through the press. The thing is, is that Prince and his team realized very quickly that they were truly entering a new medium. And there was never any discussion about, well, we have to do this and we have to do this. I pitched the project. They, they said, yes, you know, Prince says, man, I trust you. Let's just, you know, let's go. I wrote the script in 21 days in a hotel room after doing like three weeks of research with the whole Minneapolis group. We're making this, we got to do it this way. This is the way the costumes have to look. This is the way the lighting is. Here we go. Rock and roll films had not been very successful in Hollywood up to that point. Um, for some reason, they just were not working. I think I know why they're not working, and this is how we have to approach it to ensure that this one does work. Because, you know, it's a hard thing to make a film, and it's it's incredibly difficult, and there's really very little time to have a discussion about who's, like, going to pull the string. And there is no reason to even get involved in a project unless you know who's pulling the strings. The things that had made him successful in the music world were not translatable into the film world. The inspiration for that song is it was a movie the songs that ended up in the movie he and magnoli went through to pick out what would work for the film and there was still one missing song alice i think we got most of it but there's something missing i don't you need one song that encapsulates the whole vibe of the film august 3rd 1983 i was in first avenue when prince played his concert he played some of the songs we had already selected for the film we're missing the song that song, which releases you finally to become the person that you should become. He and the revolution performed. And then there's a song that's played. So after the concert was over, I went to Prince and I said, there are four songs back or three or four songs back. It kind of reminds me of a Bob Dylan ballad. He goes, oh, you're talking about Purple Rain. And I go, yeah, that's the song. And he said, can we call the movie Purple Rain? If I do something that I think belongs to someone else or I think sounds like something else, then I'll just... Do something Journey had recorded faithfully. A couple of years go by, Bob Cavallo sends a cassette. This is going to be the lead track of his first film called Purple Rain. Perhaps he may have inadvertently been inspired by the outro of Faithfully. Jonathan Kane, myself, and Neil listened to the outro of Purple Rain. Now he's singing Purple Rain, Purple Rain. John and I and Neil looked at each other and said, what, it's incredible. He's singing his own thing on top of those changes. They're just the same changes. He wrote 70 songs or something. The songs that ended up in the movie. The singles on Purple Rain. The B-sides were as good as the A-sides. The B-side of When Doves Cry is 17 Days. The B-side of Let's Go Crazy is Erotic City. These are songs that are as good as most people's A-sides, believe me. I was the liaison between Prince and the management. Cavallo, Ruffalo, and Farnoli were based in L.A. Did not want to move to Minneapolis. Steve was the youngest of the managers. Joe was money guy who could always access network. Bob was more the formidable one. We shot the movie using my money and Prince's money. The checks to the Teamsters weren't good. And the Teamsters union was threatening me all the way through this. The only thing Warners does is guarantee the loans. But it looks like the bank wants to wait till there's no risk whatsoever. They just demanded to see all the bad. footage. I show it. They hated it. 
It was two and a half hours long. You know that Prince movie couldn't be two and a half hours long. So there were scene missing slugs all through this movie before we had filled in. We didn't have some of the comedy in and whatever. Bob Daly and Terry Semmel stand up in the screening room and turn to Mo Austin and say, you want to give me another one of your rock and roll acts to make a movie? Mike Ovid, he turned around and yelled at those two guys. Hey, if you don't want it, we'll have, you'll have a check in the morning. We'll take this. Bob, I think you've got something great here. I can see when you cut this, it's going to be fantastic. So the, he basically intimidated Warner Brothers. They, wow. <laughs> they yeah. surrendered immediately. Vanity got into a money issue with them where she wanted to get paid a certain amount to be in the film, and they did not want to go with her terms. So they couldn't come to terms as to her salary, and she was cut out of the film. Ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to present the artistic director for the Minnesota Dance Theater, Miss Lois Holton. If he was playing live, it was a show for Lois Holton. It was a dance instructor that helped him and the band staging their choreography. We don't have a prince in Minnesota. We have a king. <laughs> Doing ballet lessons is a rock and roll. I movie. enjoyed the dance. He was the he Another girl that Prince was seeing named Katie was giving mm -hmm. us the dance class. Katie. Was she a... Uh, Asian girl. Asian. I knew about this relationship he had. Having a girlfriend going, okay, everybody, bend over, now do this. And our choreographer, you're passing off as the girl who's working in the dance studio. But it took Denise a minute mm. to figure it out. There was a lot of like question marks going mm -hmm. around, like what his status was with Susan. What the hell is going on? You know, it's been said that he was dating Denise and Susan yeah. and thought it was going to be like a purple orgy, you know, all bodies and everything. But there was a lot of sexual energy during the production. Yeah, and it was very strange because we all just sort of functioned. Well, what kind of classes were you taking? Acting classes. Mm -hmm. We had acting class, we had ballet class. We had... Matter of fact, there's a little story I can tell you about that. I was taking acting classes prior to doing the film. They kicked me out of class. For clowning. They just threw you right out. They threw me right out. I mean, said, Morris, uh, getting perturbed with you, making everything funny. You know, every skit we give you, you're supposed to be kind of dramatic and everything. And, and you make everybody laugh. So It yeah. looks like you have going to have a, quite a career ahead of that's you. That's right. right. And my acting teacher can't take any credit for that. Yeah, that's right. The other actor was our teacher, Don. Through a whole summer, and Prince was really excited about that. You know, and Prince participated in these classes with us, and it was fun. Don, somebody, he was teaching us. Then he started doing, like, improvisation stuff. Mm -hmm. And improvisations can go anyway. Right. There was a little tension on with um, two lead people. Mm -hmm. They were doing improv, the two of them? Mm -hmm. Oh. Barry Gordy contacted <clears throat> me, wanted to talk about Denise. Someone would know that, that he had interest in you. It just spreads like wildfire. Then it just turned into like leveraging each other. He wanted her for the film. Prince was coming to me saying like, she wants more money for the movie and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I think that more. that yeah. that was the nail in the coffin for the movie. Her agent, Hal, yeah. had been mentioning that he wanted <clears throat> her to get out of this. Right. When Vanity dropped out, he was like, do you know anybody? Mm -hmm. And I said, I have a friend, Gina. Maybe she could do it. Gina Gershon mm -hmm. was up for the part. Mm -hmm. I knew Gina from high school. We tracked her down. She flew to Minnesota. He went out and she went back to his house and whatever. And then she, I saw her the next morning when she left. And mm -hmm. I don't know what happened back at that house. And he was mm -hmm. like, she wasn't that type that he wanted. He said, you got to do better than that. The type of beauty that he was looking for had to make vanity nervous. Striking beauty, beauty walking in the door. You know, all that time we've been rehearsing with Vanity, with Denise, and I was used to, to her. So a new energy walking in was like, oh, man, oh, is this girl too good to be true? I mean, really. But even off screen, I didn't hang out with her during the filming. Prince would never talk negatively about anything. He just would dive headlong and do it. And that's why he succeeded, because he kept his confidence levels and belief in himself always to such a level that he couldn't fail. And Billboard does this huge Michael Jackson special. He sold all these records. But the last page was a giant ad for Purple Rain. It says, the Purple Rain will begin. Thriller was also the setup for Purple Rain. You know, you had Michael making that mini movie. Right. Prince was very competitive. I mean, he really took it to everybody. Uh, oh, Thriller? Oh, I'm doing a movie. He never doubted it. Right. Did everybody else around him? Sure. Everybody, yeah. 
you're 20 years old, you're looking for the ledge, and you want to see how far you can uh, push everything. And um, as an artist, I just went there just to find it. I think he wanted to be the next Elvis or Beatles. He had grand ideas for himself. He wanted to be the most famous pop success. He was a student of musicians and performers. Prince was concepting James Brown and Jim Hendrix, Marvin Gaye. His concept on the stage is like Charlie Chaplin. If you look at it, you see. I can see it, but he doesn't tell anybody that. You know? And he combines all that all the time. That's what he is. How can you miss with, <laughs> with that? Some of his look like Mick Jagger. And then he got precise with the stuff like Michael Jackson. So he took everything that worked for the biggest people. He put his interpretation onto it and made it his. He was performing. He loved being a star. He was built for that. <laughs> he loved the adoration of a crowd. And he knew it was going to take a specific thing to get that crowd going. Let's Go Crazy was recorded at the warehouse at rehearsal. Um, Let's Go Crazy was done, I, I do remember for a fact that it was done in the evening, because most of our work was, was done in the evening, but, uh, you know, try this, Lisa, try that, Matt, Wendy, why don't you do this? Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to get through this thing called life. Electric word, life, it means forever, and that's a mighty long time, but I'm here to tell you, there's something else. The afterworld. Um, he would have worked with the band arranging parts right there. Don't lie. The world you're living in. Take a look around you. At least you got friends. I call my old lady for a friendly word. She just picked up the phone, dropped it on the floor. All I heard. Am I gonna let the elevator bring us down? Oh, no, let's go. Let's go crazy. Let's get nuts. The fun purple banana tea they put us in a trunk. Let's go. When he was done with the vocal track, his lead vocal, uh, then he'd call me in and we'd do the backing home. Let's go crazy. overdubbing, we didn't need to make too many tweaks before we could go ahead and print the mix. Purple Rain was about to come out. We happened to be in New York at the same time and happened to be staying at the same hotel. But he called and I said, well, where are you? And he said, downstairs. I'm in the restaurant. We sat and he was really nervous about Purple Rain. I've kind of put it all on the line on this one. I said, well, did you do the best you possibly could? He said, yeah. I said, well, it's going to be what it's going to be. I mean, it's a new medium for you. I'm sure the music is stellar. You put your heart and soul into it and enjoy the ride, whatever that is. And, you know, I went to the premiere and I said, what was he worried about? <laughs> right. He's sexy. sexy. I think he's got a nice body too. I joined the group 78, that's five, six years. You're building and building. It's a perfect storm. There's no way to teach someone how to do it because so many things have to line up. The movie was the surprise hit of the season. You won an Oscar. The winner is Prince for Purple Rain. When Dubs cried, it sounded like nothing that was on the radio. Let's Go Crazy was number one on R&B station. There's nothing been that fast on the radio since. I could have never imagined this in my wildest dreams, and I would like to thank the Academy and, most of all, God. Thank you very much. The record sold tens of millions of copies. It wasn't just the music, it wasn't just the movie, it was the fashion, it was the style. And he had black and white kids dancing together in his videos and in the film. It's limitless. We just scratched the surface with all that stuff. I got a lot of surprises. I don't want to give them all away. The phenomenon was just crazy.
and it was this black guy doing it. My concerts have always been dear to me, and it's almost a shame that I got so good at making records. The Purple Rain Tour, nothing like that had ever done before in black music. The demand for tickets was so great. We played as much as six or seven nights in the same city. And we're talking about arenas. Everybody at the awards was talking about it. I have yet motion picture. The nominees are Lionel Richie, Purple Rain, Thriller, Purple Rain, Thriller. Life is death without adventure. Adventure comes to those who are daring and take chances. I'm not much into awards and things like that, but the, the honor was great. It was wonderful to be around great people, uh, the other musicians in the room. The rest of pop music was operating within the gray. His guitar playing, I mean, he just, <laughs> he turned into a monster. If they really listened to my stuff, they would hear more of an influence of Santana than they would um, Jimmy Hendrix. Only because he's black. Jimmy Hendrix played more blues than um, Santana played pretty. It's, it, it's the question. You can't compare people anyway. If somebody's just blatantly trying to rip somebody off, then you can't really tell that unless they play their songs, you know? See, you gotta understand something. There's only so much you can do on an electric guitar anyway. Um, I'm trying to make a career out of this. Uh, I don't want to just have one album and then out of here. I don't know if I'm getting to be a better guitar player or a better singer or anything like that, but I feel more confident. On, on the Cherry Moon, he was two albums past Purple Rain by the time he was mid to it. Or he was just done with it and ready for the next thing. He got way in front of himself. I think if he would have really milked the Purple Rain experience, it would have been even bigger than what it was. That mountaintop situation is not really all it's cracked up to be. When I was doing the Purple Rain tour, I had a lot of people who I knew I'd never see again at the concerts just screaming in uh, places they thought they were supposed to scream. He had Around the World in a Day in stores two weeks after the tour ended without a single, sounding nothing like Purple Rain. I sort of had a F.U. attitude. I didn't want to make an album that was like the second step. I think the smartest thing I did was recording Around the World in a Day right after I finished Purple Rain. The two albums sound completely different. The trip is people think, oh, it's not half as powerful as Purple Rain or 1999 or something like that. You know how easy it would have been to open Around the World today with a guitar solo that's on the end of Let's Go Crazy, just put it in a different key? That would have shut up everybody that said it's not going to be as powerful. I was making something for myself and my fans. You know, record sales, it, it, it really doesn't matter, you know I mean? It keeps the roof over your head and it keeps money in all these folks' pockets that I got hanging around here. With Prince, there's this constant tension of whether this guy is a stadium-filling global superstar or was he the world's biggest cult artist. Purple Rain, he got to do both. Now that Purple Rain has made you such a huge superstar, do you worry about the possibilities of a backlash against you? I'm not afraid of a backlash. I don't live in a prison. I haven't built any walls around myself. I'm just like anyone else, and I don't really consider myself a superstar. Purple Rain and Thriller, that whole situation, like a virgin, never going to capture what we all did in the beginning. He really thought that people would be done with Purple Rain. It's one of those kind of records where there's the world before, there's the world after. I don't know how you go from being a poor kid to suddenly being a multimillionaire. And again, with Minnesota, just having the space and the time and the mental peacefulness. I will always live in Minneapolis. It's so cold, it keeps the bad people out. After the past two years or so, it's become quite strange. Well, I went out to see Prince at Nassau Coliseum. It was a terrific show. Prince is one of the most dynamic performers you will ever see. He was just totally entrancing you. And then he got down on the stage and went still. We began to get self-conscious.
And then you heard a voice, and it was the voice of God talking to Prince. Up until then, Prince had been the rebel. Now he was maturing. I got a call from Bob Cavallo saying, we want you to see the film. It's called Under the Cherry Moon. This is the first time the recording artist has written and directed a film himself. And this film is about a scamp on the French Riviera. He and his friend set their sights on a gorgeous, wealthy young woman and decide to con her. Instead, Prince ends up falling in love with her, and the film was wonderful. But because Prince had leave you feeling morally cleansed, morally in line with God, at the end, he kills that scamp. He had to kill that scamp. Whose voice really was that voice of God? It was the voice of his father coming alive in him. That's the transition Prince was going through. First, you rebel against your father, then you become your father. That's how far ahead he was in the game. You know, Purple Rain, he's already miles ahead of all of us. Miles ahead. Yeah. When Darling Nikki was a big talking point, the, I don't think he paid attention to whether or not Tipper Gore thought his lyrics were salacious no. or wrong for kids. She helped him sell a lot of records. Exactly. I don't think he thought much about it. When one discovers oneself, I think they discover God. I think it's the other way around. If you read Prince, it's crazy every day. Sooner or later, you might wonder why people have this perception of you. I just want people to know that I'm very sincere in my beliefs. I've been accused of a lot of things contrary to this. I gave Prince his first Bible for Christmas one time, big, nice Bible. Uh, Prince, I think it's just a little confusing some things. I mean, see, because you can't serve two gods. He was a prime target at congressional hearings for sexual references like those in his song, Darling Nikki. I met a girl named Nikki. I guess you could say she was a sex fiend. I met her in a hotel lobby with magazines. He used to come out in the bikini underwear, and he, he'd rub up against the guys in the band, and then he'd go and kiss the girl, keyboard player. The situations got real tense because everybody was real saying the Lord's Prayer on stage, and then uh, going right into a tune about something, you know, sexual. It was just incredible turmoil, thinking, why isn't this making me happy? When you're in that turmoil, peace is something you want, but you have no frame of reference, you know. You have no idea what peace is, much less how you're going to get it. I was tired of being at odds. His fans say he's sexy. His detractors say he's disgusting. We say he's difficult to ignore. Welcome to the International Midnight Funk Association. All over the metro, Michigan, and the planet Earth. Thousands and thousands of members. You, 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 and you show solidarity with the MFA. If you're in bed, get ready to take it from the pillar to the potty. If you do not have your MFA ID card, it's a shame. Send a letter. Nobody bad like you. This edition of the Midnight Funk Association is now being called to order. Mojo. Yeah. That's what? I, I don't think words can describe how Detroit feels about Prince. Let's talk about Around the World in a Day, one of the greatest albums. My favorite. Tunes like Around the World in a Day, Paisley Park. What type of mood were you in when you recorded that album? I sort of had a F.U. attitude. This one is just for all the purple people, and um, I think they'll understand. I was making something for myself and my fans. The people who supported me through the years, I wanted to give them something. See, you gotta remember about Prince. You know, bands that preceded us, I mean, you know, Prince pretty much wrote, he would write the music and then, you know, the bands would learn it. He'd call some of them in for a session, you know, to play, do session work with them and stuff. But, but he was the writer. If you look at any of the Prince and Revolution albums, it says written and produced by Prince and the Revolution. That's tells the whole story right there. A lot of people think we were hired. No, we weren't hired. We were a band, and he was the band leader. The storyline in Purple Rain about Lisa and I, you never listened to our music, did you? And you never, that was never the case. No, he, he listened wanted to hear to yeah. everything yeah, Lisa and I like, did. And I dreamed you wrote a song, exactly. play it for me. And we had to keep up with him because his dedication to the songwriting and the time he spent doing it was 24-7.
He didn't wait around. I record very fast. It goes even quicker now that Wendy and Lisa helped me. That's why our two albums sound completely different. He really started using the group. Before then, he, you know, he usually did it all himself. It was done before we even hit the first show of Purple Rain Tour. Yeah. He was already bored with Purple Rain. <laughs> Out of boredom, I think I just try to change. But Purple Rain is something that people want to examine. You know, I look back, he wasn't very good at looking back, so... He just wanted to put it out. I'm not going to do any videos or any singles. Because I wanted this album to be listened to and judged to teach to as a whole. He wanted to play more and more of that songs live. They'll find it. You know, it was just going to appear. He didn't want there to be any single from it. He just wanted to put it out and let radio people find their own song to play. I think he was talked into doing the video for Raspberry Beret. He said to me in that video, he said, I hate my hair. He said, yeah, I've got the Hulk's hair. He kind of did. Yeah, the bangs. He hated the bangs. Prince was getting more and more people into the gang. While those things were going on, we were in the studio writing. That's when he met my brother and Wendy's brother. We recorded a bunch of stuff together. Lisa and I had gotten David, Lisa's brother, cassette tape of a song that him and my brother Jonathan had recorded called Around the World in a Day. It was written by Jonathan Melbourne and David Coleman, the brothers of Wendy and um, Susanna and Lisa. And it was a demo tape. They wrote a couple of new songs and and one of the songs was Around the World in a Day. And we listened to it in the car and we ran into rehearsal and made Prince come out into the car and say, you have to hear this. And we played it for Prince and he, it just blew his mind. Prince listened and he goes, do you think he'd give it to me? I said, you better talk to him. He took the tape out of my car. <laughs> What's his phone number or something? And we cut the song at rehearsal with the whole band on stage, including David and Jonathan. That's when you started to see more and more people participating in uh, recording activities. He was tapping into Wendy and Lisa. He really relied on us. He would send a master with a scratch vocal, a piano idea, and say, finish this. A member of his staff would box it up and send that package on the next flight to Los Angeles. Someone who worked for his management would go out to LAX, get that tape, and drive it to Sunset Sound. Again, Sunset Sound, we lived there. Prince was at another studio flying back and forth. Pop life, he said, I just need you to mix that song. When it goes pop, pop. Pop, that's cut tape, not a DJ and I'm going to scratch this in. You take a razor blade and you just start cutting all the pieces and taping them to the wall, marking them with what part it was. There was a wall full of cut parts of the song. We would tape it back together, and that's how I edited the song. But I think it was with Susan Rogers. So when you had a song like Pop Life, the focus is going to be on the words, the arrangement. You have to frame those lyrics so that the listener's attention goes where you want it to go. That takes a little bit more time. Around the World in a Day is one of my favorite albums. It didn't connect the way Purple Rain did at all. It didn't come out of the gate right. Kind of lost. Around the World in a Day is a funky album. Live, it's even funkier. It did not win back his core R&B audience, his soul audience. I don't think uh, I left my funk roots to begin with anywhere along the line. Um, didn't receive the attention in the press that Prince thought it deserved. For all the world today, it comes from an experience. I think that we enlightened him a little bit more about the Beatles. The influence wasn't the Beatles at all. I don't know how that would hang today. Coming from Purple Rain being a big mega smash, Around the World in a Day wanted the same audience, the same bigness, but... The fans were not ready to let that go yet. When he formed the revolution, he knew exactly what he wanted. Really think too much about the... <sighs> I didn't have much of a relationship to what it really meant in the big picture in him and his world. I was honored to be in this band. That was more like it for me. I said, oh my God, I'm part of the revolution. And it was almost a disservice to their careers to blow up to the mammoth proportion that they did because the real world isn't like Purple Rain. I'm not afraid of a backlash because, like I say, there are people who will support my habits as I have supported theirs. We came off the fishbowl effect of Purple Rain by that point, yeah. so it was nice to come break it all down. We played a corporate event, you know, a listening session. He decided he wanted to present this in person and play the entire album and for the people at the record company to sit in a room and listen to the whole album. Because I wanted this album to be listened to and judged, critiqued, uh, 
listen to as a whole. It's hard to take a trip and go around the block and stop when the trip is 400 miles. Dig? You know, the company would make that happen. It was important to him that he be there in person, look at your reactions. Typical Prince, last minute. He would have his people call up at nine o'clock in the morning and say, we are coming in at two o'clock. We want the conference table taken out. People in the room really looking forward to Purple Rain too. He went in another direction. They have these blackout curtains so that you could barely see. Mo Austin was sitting in the couch and other people were sitting on the floor. That was the vibe he wanted. He walked in with Wendy and Lisa. Uh, Wendy and Lisa were throwing uh, rose petals on the ground. He sat on the floor, legs crossed. Wendy and Lisa were with him. I watched him as this record was going on. Now, the music is obviously very different. You could see people, their eyes going down, eyes going up. You could see the shifting in the room. It was like, what do we do with this? He vibed the room. He knew what was going on. A few bars from the end of the last cut, they just got up and he walked out. He didn't want to get caught up in somebody coming up to him and saying something that he didn't want to hear. He wasn't happy with the response. I think it might have been lost on this crowd. It was in, in its way different than the other albums because of the Middle Eastern influence. What from purple to like rainbow. Around the World in a Day was like psychedelic and colorful. By the time Around the World in a Day came, his ballads really became beautiful and yeah. really personal. more personal. Yeah. yeah condition of the heart and it was just him chords and mm -hmm. melody and it makes you think of that he loved Joni Mitchell Joni Mitchell she taught me a lot about color sound and to her I'm very grateful the Beatles weren't an influence for him he he didn't even like the Beatles he was no like, he didn't Ooh. that was just not where it came from that's yeah. where Paisley Park and the yeah. song Paisley right. Park is very on true. And then it was an idea that he'd been floating for a while. On Raspberry Beret. And he says, the rain sounds so cool up against the barn roof. Mm. The horses wonder who you are. Thunder Around drowns out with the lightning sees. And, see. and you feel yeah. like a movie star? Come on. What's the tambourine? Every mm. time I hear tambourine and I when I hear him behind his drums, this is a guy that would go into the recording studio and put his headphones on behind his drums and play an entire track, do his vocal afterwards. It's straightforward, forwardly patriotic. America, Jimmy nothing never went to school. Nothing made Jimmy proud. Now, now Jimmy, Jimmy lives on a mushroom, mushroom cloud. cloud. Come on. I have two songs on my own. Alan Leeds he said, Prince wants you to pack your bags and head to LA. Got on the private plane. And we ended up going to the last show of the Jackson Victory Tour. I'll never forget it. <laughs> it was amazing. So after that Victory Tour, he goes to the studio and we recorded over Capitol Records. That was one intense session. And he plays everything and he wanted me to just go all the way out. No structure, just play, play whatever you feel, play, play, play. Uh, he had me doing things like walking from the back of the room and just walk towards the mic playing. You can hear it in the recording. Around the world in a day, it was a huge turning point in our collaboration. He climbed the mountain, for God's sake. What was he going to do, look for a higher mountain? The entertainer part of Prince took a break. Took a break. break. Yeah. When we get to the point where we stop trying to dictate what a person's supposed to do with their life and how people are supposed to perceive them, we'll be better off, you know. You know, he really stopped doing interviews for a long time. He didn't, he didn't like the idea of being able to say all this stuff, have it recorded, have other people be able to use it. He was against his instincts. And he used to, he told me, I'll tell you a secret, Prince. Writers write for other writers. They don't write necessarily to impress the act. So a lot of times it's more fun to be nasty. Suddenly this kind of scoop fell into my lap. The Howard Hughes of rock and roll is going to talk. That his relationship with his father had affected him deeply. His father, who he loved, who had been a really great musician, as Prince hoped to be. He co-wrote Computer Blue with Matt, Lisa, and I. He co-wrote The Ladder and several tunes on the new album. He's full of ideas. It'd be wonderful to put out an album on him, but he's a little bit crazier than I am. His representative said he will talk to you, but you can't bring a tape recorder into the interview. He came up with that policy as a joke about not letting people take notes or record. So I just kept my, um, my tape recorder, my notebooks um, uh, out of sight. He had restrictions after that, and I never willing to accept the restrictions. So I said, I'm, I'll pass. He liked to control things. I never interviewed him again. It's, it's unique about the situation that I'm in now with these people is that they all know who they are and... 
everybody was participating. He did utilize everybody. Purple Rain, where we were all involved. Mark Brown wrote some stuff with Prince. Wendy and Lisa heavily utilized. And then Around the World in the Day and Great Album were collaborations with Wendy and Lisa. He had come to the point to trust us so much. I don't know why no that is. reason why we're not accredited as the writers on one. And then we no, 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 no. just did some weird <laughs> stuff. Like Prince is very, was very we random. Couldn't. I felt I was underutilized. We jammed constantly every day. We were just having fun. And to do with the person that I was in love with, my girlfriend, and with the most important artist of my generation after a project was done and you'd listen back to your work. They had his back. Allowed him to experiment musically. And we were just writing a million songs a day 24 7 recording there were hundreds of songs made within those songs around the world in a day was recorded now, there are four or five different records of the revolution during those this period of time in the vault and that moved right into parade parade was dark black and white parade dream factory roadhouse garden crystal ball all these records were all being done at once Sometimes it snows in April. That song was written April 21st, 1986. When he went in, Wendy and Lisa, and he recorded that live, the three of them together. You know, I mean, sometimes it snows in April is a perfect example of that. The three of us were in our room doing that, and he started singing those lyrics over these chords we were doing. I could see in him, it allowed him to feel even bigger feelings mm -hmm. that weren't overly sexualized or angry or just bratty, which he's the master at. <laughs> sometimes we weren't in the same state. He would just send a master reel on an airplane. He'd send us ideas, sketches of songs, like a drum track and a guitar, piano and vocal, or he would just say, I need some background vocals or something that he wanted specifically. But then he'd also say, just put your stuff on it. He wrote music constantly. I think Kiss is my best work. And you know, that was an experiment in science. After Purple Rain, that was a huge blowout. We started doing a lot of projects for his label, Paisley Park. He signed Maserati, and I was put in charge of that. We're going to do this group called Maserati. I'll be in this room. You can be in that room. You can be here for about three months. I went, three months? I only brought a shirt. I had to record the tracks. A lot of times he'd do the drum and bass and send me the drum and bass, and we had to add to it. Prince would sing the vocal track, and he'd want the vocalist, whoever it may be, to sing exactly what he was singing. And that's not easy, because he's, he's, he's a seasoned singer. He's got a way of doing things that uh, not everybody can do. And he gave us this song on acoustic guitar called Kiss. Kiss was the one I'm most proud of, because I think I had more to do with that than any one of them. Really interesting story because Kiss came about totally accidentally. It was for a group that he had signed called Maserati that I was producing. When he brought me Kiss, it was acoustic guitar. No particular rhythm, just straight chords. It was a four bar blues. I found the actual song where he took it from. The track dated back to like 1938, late 20s, late 30s. He gave me a, a demo of the first verse and chorus. And he was singing it in the uh, baritone. It sounded like a country song. We said, what are we going to do with that? It sounds like Stephen Stills. No drums, no nothing. Not even in a studio, Mike. No, Maserati is a rock band. What are you going to give this to me for? He said, just do your thing to it. And I said, okay, okay, I'll give it a try. We tried to turn it into something. Sat up all night trying to figure out what to do with it. I was doing a Maserati in one room. Yeah, I was in Studio B. At Sunset Sound, he was in the other room. He was working Studio A. Completing that soundtrack record. Lionel Richie was in Studio C. I totally rewrote KISS. I put a beat to it. We programmed the drums. David Rifkin was our engineer. He had a lot of producer tricks he used to do, and he put that gated effect on the guitar. He loved that gated reverb. Susan fed that Lin LM1 to the AMS reverb box and used a preset called non-linear. Now that rhythm guitar is just me playing open acoustic chords. I gated it to the hi-hat track on the drum machine. It made that rhythm. It's impossible to physically play. Non-linear reverb just can't be replicated in the real world. Reverb in a natural setting tends to fade as the audio signal decays. Nonlinear reverb, it actually gets louder. It's... 
but it made that song stand out. It's the shimmering, shaky rhythm. Gave you that. Da -da 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 -da. The other problem we had was singing it. Yeah, he gave us a cassette. He gave us a cassette with him just doing straight acoustic guitar strum, and he was singing one verse. That was it. And it sounded like a folk song. We took it back, and we went, what the hell are we going to do with that? And uh, I started programming the LM1, the drum machine, and um, in order to fill out the rhythm, I did what he did, and then I went, nah, that's not funky. That's really really straight ahead. So I didn't like the way it sounded. It was real plain. You don't have to be beautiful. We worked on that song. Maserati, or Bruce and Mars, they got this real gospel tone to their background. You know, they come from the church where they sing. Next thing you know, Kiss was born. The, the main guy from Maserati sang the lead, but it was an octave lower than what Prince sang. The guys in Maserati, I had them do a part from a Brenda Lee song called Sweet Nothings, and they sang, eh. That was the background for her song. We just stole it. And there's only three notes, so who cares? We were working on it all night. I added a piano from a song that I was I always liked. It was a Bo Diddley song called Say Man. And the piano was like Say Man. What the it was boy? like a little trickle of a piano in there. We put that in there and then we finished it, he listened to it, and I could see by the look on his face what he never knew that song could become I had brought it to. He looked at me and said, Are you guys gonna go to dinner? I said, Yeah, we'll probably be back in about three, four hours. Why? He said let me do some work on it when you come back. Uh, I came back in four hours. I came back the next morning about 9.30 and I said, where's my tape? He had already come in. He had his vocals on it. So he had already put his voice on it. All new guitar. He already put his guitar on it. Kept the music and everything the same. There was a bass part on it. Took the bass out. You know, he removed a lot of the stuff that was on there. And he said, eh, it's too good for you guys. I'm taking it back. I was speechless. And I looked at him and I was like, you did all this in four hours. He, he says, this is a song that'll be better for, for us. And I was like, us? Who's us? Friends in the Revolution. You're going to let me be a co-writer on your album. You know, you know I'll take care of you, Mark. I never got a dime from Kiss. I co-wrote Kiss. This was the first song that I was going to be credited other than just an engineer. I was devastated, and he also renamed me David Z. That wasn't my name on the first four records. And I talked to one of the people at Warner Brothers. They said, no, it sounds like a demo. There's no bass. There's no reverb. It sounds like we did it in your basement. We're not putting that out. We don't like it. He had enough power at the time to say, you put that out first, or I'm not giving you another single. With the singer singing an octave lower, it didn't have the full impact. I mean, Prince's voice is key there. He's done a lot of things that were so different from what was happening at the time that it was a shock value. I think people don't want ceilings placed above them.